So this next data set is a real data set that a friend of mine actually gave to me and asked me to analyze. There may be some names changed because of FERPA requirements. But the goal was to be able to predict the student's scores. And we have a whole bunch of information. And I actually have recorded already a video of all this. But because it's a real data set, there are a whole bunch of tricky little details some of which you won't ever really see again in this methods class. So I've decided to redo it so that we can go a little bit faster over some of the stuff that may not be that important. But I want you to see real data sets. You spend a lot of time just figuring out how to get that to run in the computer, even before you actually get to the analysis. So here's the data set. It's got Rhode Island, some common core requirements that they want the students to learn. Some of these names may have been changed. And there's a whole bunch of different aspects that they test, both in the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. And then they have some final scores. And we want to look at the total. And because this was actually a data set that a friend of mine wanted to analyze, we did a whole bunch of complex types of analyses. For this video, we're only going to try to predict these total scores, and we're going to see how closely related they are to some of the other scores for how the students did in these categories. First off, this is an XLS file. R does not have the rights to read XLS files because Microsoft and all sorts of coding issues. So I had to save this as a CSV. But even as you save it as a CSV, this is not the title line. This isn't the title line. Here's where we finally get the titles. And unfortunately, some of these titles are really long, like literacy in social studies. That's, that's really amazingly long. And um, here they misspelled technical, which I found amusing because this is an educator. So not only did I have to save a copy of this that was a CSV, I also had to tell it to skip those first two lines. But once I did this, I was actually able to read in the data set and go here and I'm looking to make sure all my variables are right and they are. Now there's a dot one on some of these and a dot two because it's showing the separation between those different seasons and we have total dot one but over here is the first total for that fall session. That's what we're going to try to predict and we're just going to base it on some of these very first variables over here. So my first instinct was to plot all the data. This would be a matrix plot of all those variables. I'm talking 62 by 62 variables. There's no way R can draw that. Maybe if you have a really huge screen, it might. So here is an example of the scores based on overall percentages. As you can see, these are listed as categorical. The reason is because these are all percentages, 89%. And we know that means 0.89. But when R reads that, it sees the percent sign as a character. And thus, it puts all of these as not numerical data, but character stuff. So there's a couple things I want to do to fix this, including the fact that at the very end of the data set, there's some blank rows, which you can imagine how long it took me to figure this out. So I only want rows 1 through 334, because after that, it's blank rows that was in Excel, but not part of our data set. Um, here, I've just tried doing a fit real quick. And what you can see is it's counting all of these as categorical, which is a bit of a problem. So what am I going to do? Well, I want to do this for a lot of variables. I need to be able to crop out the percent sign. So I found a command which can substitute the percent sign for blank. Do you need to know this? No, that's why I'm redoing the video going quicker. There, I have gotten rid of all the percent signs, na.omit, and now my data set is all cleaned up with these listed as values. And you could divide these by 100 to make them decimal points, which would match the percentages we had before. Or you can just think of them as percentage values. This is now 89%. It's not going to matter to the computer. Uh, I do want to run this command. Did I already run it? Oh, yeah, I did right there. That will get rid of any row that has an NA somewhere in there, which turned out to be an awful lot of them. So a massive amount of time figuring out how to clean up the data set. It looks like only a little bit of code now because I've done that work. But you should know as a real statistician, you're going to spend half your time just getting the data in so that you can run it. And this data set is no exception. And we're even skipping some of the other variables that I looked at when I was analyzing it. But let's start with a model. We're going to try to predict the total score based on all these individual little pieces. And in real life, you would shorten these like 
LSS, and that's what I did when I analyzed it. But I want to leave these names here so that you can see what this looks like based on the original data set. So there's my first run. I need to look at residual plots. Okay, not bad. All right, some randomness here. There might be a little bit of pattern. The QQ plot maybe could be improved, but already it's not necessarily a bad model. Let's look at each of those variables and see if we can find something. And overall, do we see some curvature here? It, it's subtle. Literature, I really thought I saw something, and we're going to find out later that it's nothing. But it looks like curvature or, or a bow tie shape or something's going on here. Um, writing, speaking, listening, social studies. Is there again some sort of shape? Can you see how we're kind of making an animal out of this? I see a Batman shape right there. Um, technical supplies, again, this wibbly, wobbly, timey, wimey. So all these different variables give us some ideas. Maybe there's something we can do here. And that literature one looked to me to have the biggest potential. So I thought maybe we could square it. So here I did literature squared. I'm going to size it back out so that we can see the plot. I hope that you have this code if you should feel the need and you're following along. Does it look like the residual plots have changed at all? Mm, subtle if it has. Let's look at literature. Yeah, no. I still see the same thing. And overall, maybe has some swoop, right? See how there's no data up in this corner or down here, but the data seems spread out. I'm wondering if there's a pattern somewhere. So I thought, okay, let's square overall. So here's overall, and I've got overall squared. And the residual plots look the same. And when I go through each of these, overall basically still has the same pattern. So does literature, these bow tie things and animals and dinosaurs and all sorts of shapes coming out of our residual plot. That's like fish. And yeah, so I'm thinking, okay, when there's a bow tie shape, maybe that comes from interactions. Which which one had that bow tie? I think okay, literature for sure seems to have a bow tie. Maybe there's a line here and that line shifts and curves, and that's why we're getting a bow tie shape. But I'm having a hard time telling exactly what's interacting with what because this weird shape seems to happen to an awful lot of these variables. So I picked a few of these that I thought seemed to illustrate something, and I gave them these interactions. Can I size my window out? What do we have here? Okay, so because I'm fishing around, I did math modeling and literature and literature squared and the number and quantity. So these three variables, literature, math modeling, and number and quantity, they all had this weird shape to it. I'm going to try giving them an interaction. By multiplying all of them together, I'm going to get, you know, four-way and three-way and two-way interactions, all the possible interactions. If something in here can model that, I'm going to be able to find it. And I'm going to avoid looking at my summary because that's going to be an awful lot of terms. There's my residuals, and it's telling us we've, we've got some weird stuff going on because when you start trying to curve things that way, we've got a data point here or there that looks funny. But let's look at each of these one by one. That doesn't look fixed. I still kind of see the bow tie there. Um, yeah, so still seeing animals, still seeing fish and dinosaurs and Batmans. Yeah, so, eh, mediocre results. And with these mediocre residuals, look at how massive our model has become. Tons of terms here, tons of interactions, and nothing that fixed those residuals. And I need to clear my plots or I'm going to crash our... That's okay, we'll just back up the video if it happens and you will... <gasps> so... Bottom line, we have a huge number of interactions, and none of them have fixed the residuals. We're going to have to accept the fact that sometimes you can't get perfect residuals. I think I'm going to have funny animal shapes in my residuals forever, and real data will often do this to you. So 
instead of looking at these massive five-way interactions, let's just break it down to all the different two-way interactions that I've got right here. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop looking at all these plots because that's going to get obnoxious. Okay, so here we have the p-values, and look at this. None of these guys have a significant p-value. So let's take out mathematical modeling times number quantity. It's a very high p-value, 0.77. It's not exactly the highest because geometry here is a little bit higher, but it's certainly nasty, and it's a very long name. So... I'm just going to get rid of it because it annoys me. And yes, you can do that. Ugh, I'm not going to plot these because I'm going to break the computer again. Okay, well, that, that was nice. What do we see here? A bunch of big ones. And one of our biggest p-values, is it the biggest? Um, actually, no, there are other bigger ones. But this is a huge one, and it's annoying. And it is a big p-value, so it's justifiable to be able to kill it. And I forgot to not do my plots. Let's see how it's looking. Okay, we, we, we almost got this so it all fits on one screen. What do we see next here? Um, we're looking for stuff that's complicated and big p-value. We'll look here. Literature squared times math modeling, 0.73. One of the bigger p-values and definitely a complex part of it. Let's get rid of that guy. And try the summary. Now, looking through these p-values, overall right here has got 0.72. And algebra's got 0.88. Um, so those really are by far the highest ones. But I'm nervous to kill overall when overall squared is there. Overall squared is a much more complicated term than algebra. Algebra here has the biggest p-value, but overall squared is nastier. This 0.72 is big. I'm going to choose to get this guy because I want a simpler model, and he's got a big p-value. Somebody else might justify that you should do algebra first because it has a bigger p-value. That's okay. Somebody else might say kill overall before you kill overall squared, and people would argue, no, if you have the squared, you need the linear, and but you can make a stand on what you think should be done as long as you can explain that you're not just randomly doing stuff. So I'm going to take out overall squared and I forgot not to plot. This is getting simpler. Um, well, that's questionable. Now algebra is at 0.95. There's nobody else in that well, 0.86, but algebra definitely is the biggest. Let, let's get rid of it. And who's going to come up next? 0.82, that's big for overall. 0.83, that's big for writing. So, oh, look, yep, writing is what I picked. Let's, it says overall. Why did I pick overall next? Because it has a p-value 0.72, and there's nothing else really close. I mean, geometry is kind of close, but yeah, looks like overall is a good fit. And now I said geometry. Geometry is 0.5. Okay, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0.5 looks big. Point. Yeah, yeah, well. See, now, I don't want to delete statistics and probability. I feel like that should really, really be in the model. I'm going to try to keep that in there. And so anybody else that we can take out first? Geometry. What I'm hoping is if you delete geometry, that maybe statistics and probability will bump up because both of them are kind of a mathematical spatial thought something. Um, let, let's just leave statistics in and we will get rid of geometry. And how is statistics looking? Oh, 0.91. Well, that, that's a problem. We don't want to take out stats. What did I come up with? Lit squared? Why, why did I think? Oh, lit squared times the number and quantity. Okay, this is a very complicated term. It's true that the p-value is a lot more significant, but without this, my model would be a lot simpler. Let's try taking it out and see if that fixes stats. Stats is now, where are we? 0.84. Uh, it did improve it. Maybe if we took out this next one, okay, because that's also high, maybe then stats would go back up to being significant. In other words, a drop in p-value. 
Uh, I think I remember what happens next. See, I told you this isn't the first time I've actually tried making this video. Um, yeah, 0.87. Okay, as much as I really want to leave statistics in the model, there's just no justification for it. I, I, I can't, so... What I did is I went back, I'm going to put in the two that I deleted, literature times number and uh, literature squared times number. I'm going to put those back in and take out stat because that's probably what I should have done in the first place. And my whininess about I want stats to stay in there isn't going to get justified. Okay, and now we see literature squared times number. Yeah, that really is the next one to go out. It's not a big surprise. And I'll bet it's number times quantity. No, it's literature times number. Lit number. Yeah, okay, so. Okay, well, we lost stats. This is a sad day. What do we take out next? What's got a big p-value? Oh, look at this, big p-value and it's a fairly complicated term. I really think lit squared should come out next, which apparently last time I did this, I agreed. Literacy, 0.33. Okay, that makes sense, right? Because that's the biggest p-value. Um, okay, I'm going to leave literature in. Why was this an issue? Oh, because look at literature right now. 0.27. Literature should probably be the next thing we delete, but literature is used right here in an interaction. So if literature times math is important, does that imply that both literature and math have importance and they should both be in the model? Um, well, you could argue either way. I'm going to argue it should stay in. So, um, this looks like my final model that I'm going to stick with. What makes this different than the one before? I, I think I remember. I noticed I have literature there, but I also have literature in the interaction. So I don't need it both places. So I just deleted it there. There is my fit. Looks nice and small. Um... Oh yeah, the side journey. Let's talk about that in a second. First, I want to see, do I feel good about my model? Does school matter? And the answer is yes. Now, right here we have a 0.07, which is not above our 0.05 cutoff line, but other schools are significant. So I'm going to leave all the schools in there because that variable of school matters. Now, here we have speaking and listening, which is at a 0.08. Um, and it might be something we could justify taking out. I'm going to choose to raise my alpha just a little bit to leave it in because for the clients, they really wanted to be able to get some good predicting and they wanted to be able to say, here's the kind of things we should look at these students to be able to tell how we can predict. So they're going to be happy to have more that I have found to talk about. So because it's exploratory, I'm going to increase my alpha just a little bit so that speaking and listening can stay in. Now, I told you I got this data from a friend. One of the things the friend said is each of the schools might have a completely different model. So one thing I did, which I think would fit well with this video, is let's talk about school interacting with all these. Notice I got parentheses. It's a school times everything, which is going to give us a really big model. But let's go through and take a look. Here's our p-values based, here's our, here's our, wow, how long is this thing? There's our p-values. So what's significant? Um, what we have right now doesn't really show how significant the schools are. But look, here's one. It's Rockies overall acts different than the other schools overall. And here is Rockies writing acts different, but the other schools not so much. Here is the Rocky School Speaking and Listening, and the Rocky School Literacy. <sighs> Let me guess, it's Rocky School, yep. Every time something is different about that Rocky School than others. Here's Rocky's Algebra, here's Rocky's Math Modeling. Now, one of these, I remember, wasn't Rocky. Oh, look, here we go. Okay, Tollgate, pretty close to being significant, but we also know that with an alpha 0.05, you should be finding junk 5% of the time just by randomly finding patterns. So this guy being significant, I'm saying it's probably just a fluke, that, that alpha 5% error. Try to make this a little bit simpler. Um, 
I'm going to create a variable that only keeps track of Rocky so that we don't have all the schools interacting with everything. This variable is going to have Rocky, not Rocky. Do you need to know this for the methods course? No, you don't. I'm going a little bit beyond what you need, but I hope you can see how useful it might be to say, should Rocky school have a different slope than all the other schools? And instead of doing it for every possible thing we could have in the model, just go back to that very first model with all the different variables. I want to see what happens if we have Rocky in there. Is Rocky important? And the answer is, yeah, we've got some variables that interact really well with Rocky. Notice if we scroll up that these variables themselves are not significant to start with. It's only with Rocky they're significant. And as we start weeding through and taking things out, all the p-values will shift. And so when I did this with my friend, I actually did very carefully go through, create a whole bunch of different models, predicting different things, and even some other techniques we want, aren't going to talk about in this class. Because this is a long video and we want to simplify it, let's just go to the model we ended up with before, which had these variables, and I'm going to put the is Rocky with it. What do we find? Oh, I didn't want to run just is Rocky. That has the yeses and noes for is it Rocky. We find here, okay. Is Rocky based on the other variables? Well, 10%, 6% maybe, 27, 5%. So another thing you might notice right here is there's this NI that keeps showing up. That's because when we did school Rocky, this said, should Rocky have a different y-intercept? The answer was no. And this says, should Rocky have a different y-intercept? It's the same thing. So R says, yeah, I'm getting an error there. So if I ask it, right here to not do the intercept for the is Rocky variable that will get rid of that any line. Okay, so what's this video about? We're trying to practice the idea of pairing out things that aren't significant one by one and how those p-values shift and how we end up with our final model. Based on this, literature times math times Rocky. Yeah, look, look at how complicated this is. And at a 5% level, mm, we said we wanted a bigger alpha to have more things ex in our exploratory model, but literature and math times Rocky don't seem to be doing much. This is a pretty complicated thing. I'm going to say that's the first step we're going to want to get rid of. Now, looking at literature times Rocky, big p-value. It's a pretty complicated term. Let's kill that one. Uh, Math times Rocky? Yep, okay, so let's make it so that math does not have a different slope for Rocky versus the other schools. That's why this wording says math, same for Rocky. Rocky is going to have the same slope in math as the other schools. And what do we have left? We've got Rocky versus speaking and listening. That's the only one left. Big p value. We just don't see enough evidence here that separating Rocky really gives us a better model. That's surprising because we saw some significant p-values with Rocky before, but when we went through and paired it out, those variables didn't stay significant. And like I said, this was an actual analysis for a friend, and so we went deeper into a lot of the other variables we're not looking at. We were able to find things. For us, I think this is the right model for the methods class. And I'm going to really quick look at those residuals, make sure I didn't ruin anything, because I haven't looked at my residuals in a very long time. That looks about the same as I remember them. Same for these guys. But doing this is a really good habit because sometimes you'll accidentally delete something that you didn't mean to, and it'll mess up your residuals, and that's a clue that you've cut something that had a significant p-value that you shouldn't have. So when it's time to write the report, what am I going to talk about as far as how I explored this? Well. I explored overall squared and literature squared. I'm going to talk about how I looked for all those interactions and then how I looked at the schools and how Rocky School was interesting and how I tried giving the Rocky School its own slope, which would be a school times all these variables type interaction. And yes, it's true I went a little further and even made a special is Rocky or is not Rocky variable, which you're not expected to do. but. The reason you want to talk about all these things is because these might be ideas the client has thought of, and you can say, yeah, I did look into that. The data just didn't support that that's going to be helpful to the model. 
it also helps me as a teacher know that you have looked at quadratics and you understand interactions and that you've tried it even if your final model doesn't end up having all those things in it. Now the client deserves to hear that there are some patterns in the residuals. So I even plotted some because I said there were slight patterns. I want them to be able to see what I'm talking about. But I'm also going to make a statement that this is the best model that can be used with the data. I believe I have got as good a model as anyone would be able to get using these methods. So let's wrap up the report. Um, you should have a link that will give you a copy of this so you can scroll through it at your leisure. But basically I went through and got the coefficients for each of the variables so that I could then make the prediction equations. Now each school has a unique y-intercept and I noted that in my report. Um, then I talked about how speaking and listening is going to increase it by this much. It's a simple linear term. But math modeling and literature have this complex interaction. As math goes up, the scores go up. As literature goes up, the scores actually go down. There, there was one line that was down like this for a very, very low level of math modeling, but that was also very, very rare. So I drew like 20 different lines and then I picked these three as being fairly representative of what I think the client really wanted to know. And this was a real client and we did talk about these things. Why is it that literature is going down? And so what we found is the R squared is low, the standard error is huge, we can't really predict how well kids are going to do on these scores. And look at these pictures. Of course you can't. If I tell you the math modeling, can you tell me what score they're going to get? No, not very well. So while we did not get good predictability, which was actually what my friend wanted, we can show that math modeling increases, literature decreases, and this interaction. So future recommendations, I, I think there's more that needs to be looked at the Rocky School. Even doing some more complex stuff, we couldn't really find good explanations of what was going on there. Uh, we also should investigate why literature lowers the scores. That one, if you break it into some of the other variables we didn't use, you can actually figure out a little bit more of exactly what's going on there. But this is a data set that I hope shows you how complex it can be, but once you tear out the pieces, you get your final model, you explain the interactions, and how to go through and eliminate the different variables that aren't going to be used until you have your final model. If you feel confident with that, then for the next few homeworks, let's take a real data set, not an easy data set, and I want you to practice how to go through it step by step, just like what you've seen here.